in the previous lessons, we talked about some physical background of diffraction and what actually happens and where does the signal come from and also about some instrument uh, configurations, which ones are suitable for recoil refinement and which ones are less suitable. And now I want to move on to sample preparation and then also talk again about some instrument settings. So what, when we start a measurement, what parameters do we actually set and why do we choose these parameters? So sample preparation, um, I get a lot of requests from Profex users for help. Usually I ask, can you send me the data set or your entire refinement project? because I never know from the description what the problem is, so I have to have a look and see what, what is going on. And my impression is that a lot of the problems I see could be solved by proper sample preparation. And what you see here on the screen are two refinements. And it may not come as a surprise after what I just said, but the question is, what, what is different? Obviously, the fit looks very different. And I can tell you that it's exactly the same specimen. It was measured on the same instrument with the same instrument setup. So con all the optical configuration, all the, the, the measurement parameters were exactly the same. It was both of them were refined with Profex using the same refinement strategy. So obviously the only difference is the way I prepared the sample. And for demonstration purpose, in the top right data set, I introduced just about every error I, I could. <laughs> so, just for a demonstration. On the bottom right, on the bottom left, it's a pretty good refinement, but you can still see something going on down here in this area. It's not a perfect refinement, but it's pretty decent. Whereas the one on the top right looks absolutely awful. So, Sample preparation is really, really crucial to get a good diffraction pattern. Sometimes we encounter problems during the refinement that are just inherent to the sample. Sometimes the sample is problematic. But very often, some are just related to sample preparation. And once we, we get a good data set from a proper sample, the refinement can be surprisingly easy. So what I want to, to raise awareness for is the problematic samples are hard enough to deal with. They can really take hours to find a good solution for, for the refinement. So we should really do our best to minimize the, the problems that are under our control. So the ones we, we can actually avoid by sample preparation. And there is a whole list of things we can do wrong. Um, graininess, microabsorption, texture, sample height displacement, sample roughness, sample transparency. And I want to go quickly through all of these to show you what the problem is and how it manifests in the diffraction pattern. Starting with graininess. From a single crystal, as we discussed in the, at the very beginning of the first lesson, we get, once we orient the crystal and bring it in diffraction condition, we get single spots as a diffracted signal. On the other hand, from a perfect powder, perfectly disoriented, we get these concentric rings from the diffraction cones that we scan through. Now the question is, what do we get for a sample that is somewhere in between from a coarse powder? And the answer is very obvious. We get something between spots and rings. And on this example from a synchrotron data set, we can see examples of spotted diffraction rings. The one over here, this one is not smooth at all. This one is much smoother, but this one is kind of spotty. And now imagine that our detector scans this path. Over here, it will register a fairly high intensity. But if it happens to scan this path, at the same diffraction angle, it would detect hardly any intensity. The same sample, um, just the way it, it's oriented, so the detector happens to scan on a, in a different direction. We would get two data sets with different peak intensity at this diffraction angle. And we would be looking for a solution. We would think it's, there's something different in this sample. 
So is this, has it reacted? Is something going on? The, the reason is shown here. It's just poor sample preparation. It's because we don't get a smooth signal. So what we get from a grainy sample is non-reproducible intensities. Sometimes the peaks are much higher than we would expect from our structure model. And then we would think, mm, is there some substitution, something going on? Sometimes peaks are much weaker or even missing. So it will cause the same problem for us for the refinement. It's not what, what we would expect. And we, we will, it will lead us to a wrong path to find a solution for that when it's just poor sample preparation. A fairly extreme case of grainy samples is the so-called rocks in dust example. Um, you can see a, a smooth, a rather smooth powder diffraction pattern on this area detector frame, so the concentric rings, but then we also see some spots. That might be just one crystal, one large crystal in the sample that occasionally generates a diffraction spot. And if we happen to measure this spot, figure that we would scan here and hit this spot, we would get a huge peak. It's almost, it's probably uh, more intense than the most intense powder peak out of nowhere. And then we re-prepare the sample and it's gone because we don't hit the same peak again. So this can be very misleading and it can cost us a lot of time to realize that it's just poor sample preparation and has actually nothing to do with the composition of the sample itself. So what, what can we do to reduce it? Ideally for powder diffraction, the, the perfect um, particle size is in the range of one to five micrometers. Then we get the good particle statistics, so randomized powder, smooth diffraction rings. But if we mill more to below one micrometer, we would start seeing effects of over milling, so of, of nanocrystal domains forming, and we would affect the, the resolution of the diffraction pattern. So ideally one to five microns or certainly below 10 microns. Also what, what we discussed in the previous lesson, the more particles contribute to the diffraction signal, the smoother our diffraction rings get. So if we, if we would narrow down the divergence slit to just a small area on the sample, we would not get an, such a smooth ring signal than if we use the whole area. So that's not just intensity, but also particle statistics is a reason why we should adjust uh, the aperture settings on the instrument for optimum intensity and and particle statistics. I mentioned before that I like to spin the sample. This further helps during the measurement to randomize the orientation a little bit. The effect is not very strong because most of the crystals, uh, they, they will just stay in diffraction condition, but it helps a little bit to, to create a smoother diffraction pattern. And also when we spin the samples, I want to have a full revolution for each step so I have the maximum amount of disorientation that I can get for, for each measurement step. The next example of poor sample preparation is called microabsorption. And uh, in the following scenario, uh, we, we, use, uh, we have one phase, the blue phase, with a high absorption coefficient for the radiation we use and the green phase with a low absorption coefficient. So a short penetration depth into the, the blue crystals and a long penetration depth of the radiation into the green crystals. Now figure the following scenario. On the left, the sample is coarse. So what happens if the primary beam interacts with a blue crystal, it will be absorbed quickly and we will get the diffraction signal only from a small volume of interaction. On the other hand, if, this, if the beam happens to interact with the green crystal, it will not be absorbed much. It will hit another crystal, which might also be green, and we get a much larger volume of interaction from the green phase. 
On the other hand, if the same sample was, was fine-grained, the, the, every particle would just absorb an insignificant amount of the radiation. So the blue particle will absorb a little bit, but the next particle the radiation interacts with might be green, might be blue. So on its path through the sample, every crystal just absorbs an insignificant amount of radiation. So on average, the beam will interact with a representative number of blue and green particles. So on the left, the coarse sample, we will get a strong bias of the phase quantities. The blue phase interacts, so the, the, the radiation interacts only with a little bit of the blue phase, but much more of the green phase, and this will translate to our phase quantification. So we would overestimate the green phase by quite a big amount. On the other hand, if the same sample was finer grained, we would get a representative interaction volume for the blue and the green phase, and we would get an unbiased phase quantification. What is a bit difficult about microabsorption, the diffraction, the, the, the fit, the Rietveld refinement looks good in both cases. So it's, it doesn't show as a poor refinement, um, even the left case. We just get a biased result, just a wrong result, but the fit looks good. So it's a bit hard to track uh, once you, you don't get the quantities you expect. You would have to have a look at the sample in, in the SEM, for example, and check or, or measure the particle size of, of the sample in the state you used for XRD analysis. So after milling, whatever you did to the sample, to be sure, or just find a way. So just make sure with your sample preparation routine that you get fine powders typically below five microns, between one and five microns. So um, if you need accurate phase uh, quantifications, then this is very crucial to make sure that your sample preparation routine generates small particles. It's not about crystallites, it's about particles. So in case of conglomerates, it's the conglomerate that counts, not the crystallite. So to, to to manage microabsorption, um, as I just said, it occurs if the sample is composed of large particles and if there is a large absorption contrast. If the blue and the green phase absorb the same amount, the sim similar due to similar chemical composition, then this effect is, is negligible. But if you have a light and a heavy phase that absorb much very different the radiation then this will be pronounced and you can only reduce it by grinding or milling your powders to the perfect particle size so to summarize both effects we discussed so far both are related to the particle size and as i said ideally you should reach one to five microns larger particles may lead to microabsorption and also to grainy signals to unreliable uh, peak intensities, but you can also mill too much, especially this high energy mill I'm showing here, this planetary mill is very high intensity milling and it can destroy your crystal structures. You can introduce defects, so you start seeing more and more strain in the lattice, which shows in the diffraction signal, and also you start forming an amorphous phase. So that's also something to keep in mind. Um, usually manual milling is very time consuming in the mortar, um, but it certainly doesn't over mill. It's more prone to under milling because you get a sore arm from milling. And the other option is this automatic mill, the Macron micronizing mill. It's become a kind of an industry standard because it seems to be very well suited to reach this ideal particle range without overmilling. You still can overmill if the materials are not that hard. So hardness five, for example, you still have to make sure you don't overmill, but it's, it's pretty good for that. Um, I think it's nowadays sold by Rech or some, some of the big uh, mill manufacturers. So this is a convenient solution or manual milling.
The next effect I would like to discuss is texture or preferred orientation. You may hear both names equally. I usually refer to it as texture, others prefer the term preferred orientation. So what it, what it is, is um, it, it occurs when the crystals are either platelets or needles, fibers, whiskers, rods, or so some anisotropic shape. We want a perfectly randomized orientation in our sample, but with these shapes, once we press the powder into the sample holder, we will create an orientation at the surface. So the surface layer that interacts with the radiation is no longer randomized. And we can also see an example in this frame here. It's not, by the way, this is a very pro pronounced spotty ring here. Again, another example for what we discussed before. But what I'm focusing on here for texture is this. You can see that it's a smooth ring but it's stronger in certain direction than in other directions because of this preferred orientation of the crystals. So in certain direction, we have more crystals contributing to the diffraction ring than in other directions. And again, the same problem, depending on where we scan, um, we might end up with, with uh, biased peak intensities. To avoid this, there are different approaches, sometimes it's really hard. If you have platelet crystals like gypsum, you can, for example, shave off the top layer of the sample. So instead of the last step being a pressing step, you want to overfill the sample a little bit, the holder, and then shave off the, the top layer. So you don't measure the compressed layer, but, but the shaved layer. Or there are some special sample holders that are less prone to um, this effect, for example, the backloading sample holders, so you don't compact the, the surface you measure, but on the back, and then you, you, there should be less orientation. Or you can texture the surface with a pattern, with a, like a dented stamp. You just press it into the surface to create a rough surface. Or if you search on the internet, you will find a lot of rather creative solutions. <laughs> some involving Vaseline, so you, you create a sticky surface and then you sprinkle powder on it and the crystals fall and stick into this surface and just stay stuck in a random orientation. Or you fix the surface layer with hairspray in a disoriented way. Also, there is a mathematical model we can activate during the refinement to model this kind of peak bias, intensity bias. Um, the problem is that the, the algorithms for phase quantification don't work very well with textured samples. So the more we have to model this texture, the more biased or the less capable of the calculating correct phase quantities the, the algorithms will be. So it's still a strong incentive to avoid texture in the first place during sample preparation, but it's not always possible. We can just minimize it, but not completely eliminate it. And then we have to use the algorithms to model the rest. Then we have three effects that are very similar. The first one is sample height displacement. So if you focus on the sample here, um, it is a little bit below the, the center of the goniometer of the instrument. And what happens in this parafocusing geometry is that the, the convergent beams here on the diffracted side will be displaced. If the sample is too, too low, it, the, the beams will not converge in the center of the detector, but a little bit at lower angles. So this will cause a shift of the peaks on the two theta axis. Too low, shift towards lower angles. Too high, sample shift towards higher. If it's just a little bit, um, we always have a minimum, a fraction of a millimeter sample height error. That always happens. And it can be modeled in the refinement. There's an algorithm for that. If it's too much, it, the beam will actually be blocked by these apertures here. And then things get really bad the, if the, the peak is partially blocked we will end up with different peak shape. We cannot fit the shape anymore. 
but that's really a severe case. So usually this is something, just make sure that your sample surface is really flat with the sample holder and the instrument is, is adjusted correctly. So the sample is really in the center of the instrument. If there's a fraction of a millimeter displacement, that's okay. We will not even notice. It will be modeled during the refinement. But um, if you overfill the sample holder and you leave a, a hill of powder, this will become very relevant. The second sample roughness is very similar. In this case, the sample is centered correctly, but the surface is rough. So we have, again, surface areas on the sample of different levels. So part of, of the sample will be registered correctly with the sample holder and centered on the instrument. But the low parts, the, the holes in the sample surface will be too low. So we get a blurring of the signal. Parts of the peaks are shifted because of this and parts of the peaks are centered correctly. So we end up with a slightly worse resolution blurred peaks. And the, thir the third effect, sample transparency, occurs when the radiation penetrates deeply into the sample. Again, the same effect. We get signals from the surface, but also from lower areas of the sample. So we end up with a blurred signal. And that, that is the reason why I recommend to use radiation that does not penetrate deeply into the sample. That's why we prefer for the reflective geometry, the brack brentano geometry we see here, we prefer a long wavelength radiation like copper, chromium, um, cobalt, maybe iron. Iron, I don't know, don't remember the wavelength, but certainly not molybdenum or silver or anything like that. We don't want penetration into the sample. So to summarize, what should we do? For, sample, for, for the perfect sample during sample preparation, we have to make sure somehow that the crystallites and the particles are in the range of one to five micrometers. We have to make sure that they are randomly oriented, that the sample surface is perfectly flat. Once it's on the instrument, it's perfectly centered on the axis of the goniometer. And we also want a high packing density. So don't just sprinkle your powder like that and you end up with a very porous sample body, but compact it into the sample holder because this reduces penetration depth. Helps getting a high resolution signal. So below, and the, the pictures um, is, is me preparing a sample. So you probably do the same more or less. Um, I fill the sample holder, I use a microscopy glass slide to compact it into the sample holder. And then step three is when I push the glass slide to shave off the top layer of the sample to reduce texture. And then something I teach to students all the time, clean your sample holders and just to, to keep the instrument clean. Also, we use a, a sample changer robot that grabs the sample pulls it out and places it on the instrument. And we had situations when the sample holders were so dusty that they fell out of the, uh, of the sample robot. And then you have a mess on the instrument. So it also helps that it can grip the sample holder safely and place it on the instrument. Okay, now that the sample is placed on the instrument, we have to decide to, uh, how do we set up our scan parameters. And this time I'm not going to talk about apertures. I think that this is once you have found a good configuration of divergent slit and solid slits, you don't touch it anymore. Once it works for your application, that's fine. But uh, we also have to decide which angular range do we measure, at which step size and with which counting time. And I want to give you some advice just from my own experience, how I choose these parameters and maybe you uh, can use them for, for your own measurements as well. So starting with the angular range, where do we start? Where do we end? It is extremely important to measure all the low angle peaks because the low angle peaks are more indicative for, for your phases. So at, as of a certain angle, there's just tons of small peaks, low peaks. <coughs> 
These are not so indicative, but if you find a peak like this one highlighted here, it's very indicative for and very helpful for phase identification because that's where the phases differentiate and look, look different. So make sure there is, there is no peak you missed below your starting angle. And then the high end, well, generally higher is better, that's true. But I will show an example later on that does not really contain much information anymore. So the phases I usually measure, the most important range is around 30 degrees, between 20 and 40. Maybe. That's where the strong peaks occur. And also, of course, the low angle peaks, which may be very uh, important to capture. At the high angle for copper radiation, I usually measure up to 60 degrees if I'm doing phase quantification and sometimes up to 80. It depends a bit on the application. Uh, I will show an example afterwards. So how low should you start? Um, what we see here on the left, that's the primary beam we start to measure. So or scattered radiation directly scattered from the primary beam. And this is no useful information. So at some point you will see a sharp increase of the intensity and then you know you're too close to the primary beam. So you're almost at zero, so your primary beam almost goes directly into the detector. That we don't need. And it, if we really hit the primary beam at zero degrees, we would damage the detector most probably. So we don't want that. So this is a bit too much. Um, on the other hand, here's an example. I think it's corundum. It's the reference sample. I started at 4 degrees, which is my standard starting angle. And it took me half of the time to measure this sample, just to measure background. There's no information. Um, if I know that, so if I know, if I have an idea of my composition, I, I can avoid that. I could speed up the measurement by factor 2 just by skipping and starting maybe at somewhere between 20 and 25. Um, so there's no need to measure empty background. It doesn't really contain any useful information. So what I do, here's a very long scan going up to, so it started very low at probably around 2 degrees and it goes up to 120. And this is one of my calcium phosphate ceramics, synthetic materials. and what, Usually I like to measure the range from 5 to 60, maybe up to 80 degrees if I want to do phase quantifications. So the information up here is really not helpful for phase quantification. It's all about this stuff here, also the low angle stuff. So there's one tiny peak here that I want to capture, that's important, and then all this stuff here. So. This range is up to, to 70, um, something 60 or 80 is what I usually do. If I want to do a structure refinement, refine um, atomic positions, for example, or, or um, site occupancy factors, this information up here is actually helpful. There's some information in this part that, I, that helps stabilizing my structure refinement. So in that case, I will certainly measure up to more than 60, probably even more than 80 degrees, maybe 100 or even 120 degrees. This is for the ceramics I work with. In the previous example, we saw that the pattern of corundum here looks very different. It only starts at 25 degrees. So for you, this may be very different. Met metals, for example, they don't have any low angle peaks. They usually start around here, maybe, and 25 degrees. So this is something you, you have to match to your own applications. But for my ceramics, that's what I work with. So the next parameter is step size. How often should we sample the pattern? In which steps? And there is a general recommendation that every peak should be described by at least five data points. So in this example, if, if I consider this to be the, the, the main part of the peak, I'm using seven data points. The step size was 0 0.0122 degrees to theta. This is what I, what I want to achieve. 
You can also oversample your data set. You don't need a super fine description of your sharpest peaks. It just takes much longer, but it, it doesn't really help. The data set will be larger, the, measure, the scan time will be longer, and, and the data processing will be slower. So at least five, like seven points to describe the sharpest peaks in, in your sample, are, that's sufficient. So typically, this value for lab instruments is somewhere in the range of 0 0.01 to 0 0.02 degrees to theta. And then the third parameter, the, the time per step. It's a bit difficult to make a general statement about that because the two diffraction patterns you see here were measured on different instruments, but both were measured in 12.5 minutes. On the one, we get 7,000 counts, on the other 180 counts. And the difference is that the left one was measured on a, on a linear detector, so a rather modern detector, and the right one on an old point detector that is just less effective and takes much longer to reach the same intensity as the linear detector. So I cannot really tell you how, how, much, how long to measure per data point without knowing what instrument you use, but I can still give you some personal um, experience. Um, again, if we zoom into the same two data sets, we can see that if we don't have enough intensity, we, enough counts, there's a lot of noise and sometimes it's not clear if this is a peak or if it's just noise. So that's difficult to interpret. Also, there are ranges that might be um, misleading and we might think it's a peak when it's not. On the other hand, on the left side, we can see that much clearer what is a peak and what is not. So I like to reach roughly 5,000 counts if, I'm, if I don't need super low detection limits. Um, on, a, on, a, on a high intensity measurement, I like to go about 10,000 counts. So that's about what you see on the left. Here's another example that's around 5,000 counts. It gives me a reasonably low noise pattern, the strongest peak, 5,000. The background in this case is around 100 counts. That means the, the amplitude of the noise is the square root of 100, it's 10 counts. And from this I can estimate, roughly estimate, a signal to noise ratio of 500 and that would translate into a detection limit of a bit less than 1% for this strongest phase. So that's for a ceramics with a relatively complex diffraction pattern, that's quite okay. On the other hand, if I, do, if I decide to use, oh, by the way, this was measured with 0.15 seconds per step. And if I increase the counting time to 0.5 seconds per step on the same instrument, I get about 12,000 counts on the long, uh, strongest peak. My background is about twice the intensity, noise amplitude, 15 counts. And then it would reduce my detection limit a little bit to about 0.4 weight percent. Even though it's more than twice the counting time. So to summarize all this, what we learned in this uh, lecture about sample preparation, a good sample contains particles in the range of one to five microns. It is free of texture or preferred orientation. It is a compact powder with a perfectly flat surface that is precisely centered on the instrument. And we want to set up our instrument, pref preferably uh, parafocusing Brack-Brentano geometry, to maximize the irradiated area on the sample. So we change our divergence slit to a setting that maximizes this area. And if you have a beam mask controlling the, the width of the area, we also change that accordingly. And then we get ideal uh, intensity and good particle statistics. And then when we start the measurement, we have to make sure that we capture all the low angle peaks we don't miss anything at the low angles. 
we use a sufficiently small step size, this parameter is really instrument specific. So make sure you determine it once with your reference sample, with a, with a corundum sample, for example. Your peaks will never be sharper than that, only wider. So you can use a reference sample to just once determine how what, what step size do you need and then never touch it again. And we choose a, a, a time per step so we get an adequate signal to noise ratio, which depends a bit on what we want to do with the sample. The counting time per step, which determines my signal to noise ratio, is actually the parameter I change the most. If you follow all these recommendations, you should have good data sets for Rietveld refining.